Um, I'll start with a bit of background on what actually constitutes um, tax debt. I'll talk about some analysis issues that we've come up against while dealing with it. Uh, and then I'll also talk about an interim model that we've set up for reasons that will become clear. Then I'll hand over to Nikki, who will talk about uh, the need for an enhanced debt model and then how we try to frame that problem, so the um, bathtub of debt from the title, and also some uh, more technical details about how the system dynamics model actually works and some things we had to play with to try and get it to do that. And then also next steps and future uses of the model. So firstly, what actually is debt? Uh, first question, what is a tax debt? It's essentially where a taxpayer owes us money by a certain date and hasn't paid it. Uh, seems simple enough, but also you need to consider what is not a tax debt. Uh, the most obvious thing here is where a taxpayer should be paying us some or more money than they are, but we don't know about it. Uh, there's two ways of doing that. There's the legal way, which is avoidance, where you usually have a team of expensive accountants to work out schemes for you. Uh, there's evasion, which is the legal way you basically just ignore us completely and hope we won't notice. Uh, now, within what actually is tax debt, there are several different types of debt within that. Uh, first, there's known debt, which is where uh, the debtor has told us how much they owe us, usually by sending in a return, but hasn't actually paid it. Uh, there's estimated debt, where we know they should owe us something, but we don't really know how much, so we have to estimate it, usually based on what they've paid us in the past. There's spurious debt, where they think we think they owe us something, but they actually don't. Uh, there's various ways this can happen. Most commonly, it's due to issues with companies having several different accounts with us, so it might be a large company that has lots of subsidiaries, each with a different tax account, so the payments might go into the wrong one. And then there's also penalties, which are additional debts for not paying any of the previous three, um, either at all or on time. How much debt is there? The headline debt balance is around £20 billion, uh, but that also masks a lot of churn that's going on in the background. So every year you actually get a churn around £50 billion um, of annual clearances. So some issues that have come up. Uh, following the recession that we may or may not still be in, depending on who you're listening to, uh, the level of interest in debt has risen quite substantially, uh, essentially because two different governments now have both seen a 20 billion debt balance and thought we'd quite like some of that money, please. Uh, and as a result, the analytical resource devoted to it has also gone up. And this has allowed us to do a lot more work than before on debt and uncover a few issues that weren't previously thought of quite so much. Um, so I'll start with a bit of history. Um, historically, uh, what happened to debts of different values was that uh, high-value debts would receive letters from us and then phone calls and then distraint, which is where we take the debtor's um, possessions up to the value of the debt, or even court action and bankruptcy. Uh, that's what I'm terming active pursuit, whereas some of the lower-value debts would actually just get regular um, warning letters saying, you owe us money, you haven't paid it, but not a great deal else, which is a more passive pursuit. Now, in theory, staff would carry out the active pursuit by working down uh, the list of debts, starting the highest value ones, and just keeping going until they run out of time. Uh, however, in practice, it wasn't quite that simple. The value reached um, tended to differ quite substantially by tax type. Great. One of the main... Can you tell us the, the cut-off point of where... <laughs> <laughs> sort of. Um, actually, I've done this presentation internally. We had that in. I thought I'd better take it out for um, presentational reasons. Um, historically, it was about eight to £10,000. It's now much, much lower, so you've missed your chance. <laughs> uh, so it actually differed heavily by tax type even around that, though. Uh, one of the main reasons for that is because the rules for entering information onto our databases differed substantially between the different types of tax, uh, which meant the staff couldn't easily transfer from one to another. Uh, just to give an example, if you're entering onto a database an amendment of £100, depending on which tax you're talking about, that could mean amend the debt value up by £100, down by £100, or to £100. Hence the problems. The other issue is that debts do not get linked across tax types. Uh, this is something that is being worked on, has been being worked on in various different ways for years, but currently we don't automatically know if the same company owes us money on VAT and corporation tax, for example. Another issue, what's the counterfactual to what DMB, which is Debt Management and Banking, who we do analysis to support, actually do? If they stop doing anything, what would happen to debts? And this is where a concept of self-clearance rate comes in. This is essentially what percentage of debts would actually pay without us needing to do anything at all. Um, there's an assumption here as well that the impact, of, uh, the impact of value on that rate is actually quite substantial, particularly 
if it's a very large debt, if it's, say, Tesco have forgotten to pay their pay as you earn of several million pounds, the chances are that they'll just pay it up within a couple of days because they know that we would chase it, so we don't actually need to be ready to do so. And we need to attempt to factor this into our benefit and cost calculations because there's no point saying the benefit of a particular change is X million of pounds if actually a lot of that money would have come in without you making that change. Another issue is how much debt and therefore how much benefit is really up for grabs in changes to what we do. So for this, you need to take out the self-clearing debts that would have cleared without doing anything. Uh, bankruptcy is an unavoidable write-off. So write-off is where we give up on a debt entirely. And clearly, if a company has gone bankrupt, there's not much we can do to get that money. Also, the spurious debts, which when we investigate them further, we find weren't actually debts in the first place. So if you take out all of those, it's then the portion that's left, which are the debts where we could actually get payment on something that if we left it alone for long enough, we'd eventually have to give up on. And that's where the benefits can come from. And HMRC have been doing a lot recently to try and make sure that we actually bring in debts of that kind. Um, so hence the picture there. And um, the guy there is a person called Pompey John, who goes to every Portsmouth home game and rings a bell for the entire 90 minutes and somehow has not yet been bent to death with it. Uh, but football clubs such as Portsmouth are prime examples of debts where if you leave them just sitting around for long enough, the club might go bust and then you get nothing. So we're trying to pursue those by taking those people, actually in this case, to court much earlier on. More issues? Uh, a question that comes up a lot, what is the value of an FTE, a full-time equivalent um, employee, working within debt management and banking? Historically, when that question was asked, the answer would just be the total uh, receipts that come into DMB divided by the number of staff. But there's a problem there that generally when someone's asking that question, it's because they want to either add some staff or take away some staff and want to know the impact of doing that. So that's where we need actually the marginal impact of what difference would it have to, would there be from having one person more or one person fewer actually working on this. And this is where the self-clearance rate becomes particularly important because you need to think, well, okay, this person might bring in X amount of money, but how much of that is really new. Also an issue that's come up about when is a debt not a debt. Uh, this is particularly for pay-as-you-earn chaps payments. This is um, employers paying the empl their employees pay-as-you-earn. So it's coming um, to them via employee salary packets and then they need to pay it over to us. Uh, for larger employers this is done monthly and a lot of the very large ones will do this through chaps payments which are the same day kind of automatic bank transfers. The issue occurs when payment is made on the deadline day, usually quite late in the day, because they want to push it as far as they can for cash flow purposes. But it doesn't actually then get posted onto our systems until the next morning. In the meantime, a transfer is made from the pay as you earn system to the debt system, uh, showing that a debt has been created, which is actually a spurious debt, because there's never a debt in the first place, and then it gets immediately cleared the following morning. So there's no particular issue here in terms of workload, but there is an issue in terms of the figures that are collected for the total annual new debt and the total um, paid debt every year. So I think the only bit of audience participation we've got here, does anyone have a guess at how much money that was inflating our figures by? A lot is right. Anyone else have a more quantified guess? Half a billion. Half a billion? Anyone else? 10%. Uh, well, it's even more than 10%, but 10% would have been about 5 billion, I suppose. It's actually 36 billion. <laughs> yes. Um, so clearly this is an issue both for collection and dissemination of statistics. Is that an annual number? That's an annual number, yeah. So yeah, 3 billion a month. What should that be when you sell the 20 billion? Sorry? No, the debt balance is 20 billion. But, but this is... It used to be. This is uh, the 50 billion is with this taken back out. So it was 86. <laughs> so clearly this also has relevance to the first issue about the value of an FTE. If you've inflated a 50 billion figure by an additional 36 billion, then you're quite badly wrong on that figure. So moving on now to some interim modelling. Uh, this was particularly required for a thing called the um, Departmental Transformation Programme. Essentially what this meant uh, for DMB was changing the way they pursue debts. So moving away from the historic picture of the active kind of high value and the passive low value I was talking about earlier, moving to a more campaigns approach. The theory here is to hit as many debts as possible while they're quite new. And the idea of doing that is that uh, two things. Firstly, we can take advantage of variations in the inflow rates of different tax types. So debts tend to come in when there's a deadline for a particular tax. So that actually varies 
quite a lot across the year for the different types. Um, also, through actually having more people on this, so there's an expansion of the debt management call centres. And the idea being if we can resolve more of these debts early on by having a proper campaign, sending more letters, doing more phone calls to back it up, that is a lot cheaper than then having to pursue the same debts much further down the line when we'd, we'd have to take them to court or something like that, which is substantially more expensive. Uh, for this, we produced a quick Excel model based on the assumption that this change allowed us to actively work more lower value debts and essentially move down the threshold that I was mentioned earlier of the eight to 10,000 to much lower figures. Uh, and a quick flowchart of how this works for benefits purposes. So you'd have 100 additional debts being worked, being um, actively pursued. The assumption is that 40 of those would not actually pay, so we'd either give up on them or they'd just go back, go back into our systems. 60 would pay, so that's the receipts. Uh, there's an assumption that 48 out of that 60 would have actually paid anyway, possibly not quite as quickly, but they would have ultimately paid up. And it's the 12 that wouldn't, which then constitutes additional receipts, which is then the benefit from making this change. I shall hand over to Nikki to talk about the even better modelling we're now doing based on that. We were increasingly finding that uh, we were being asked questions by our customers in debt management that the quick Excel model was never really designed to, to answer in the first place. So we wanted to, to move on from there and produce a more enhanced model. And the real aims in doing that were to improve our overall understanding of what were the drivers for both the inflows and the outflows of debts and to continue to provide reliable and consistent results and in fact, improve our results and make them more robust so we could feed things back into the change program or staff reductions. We also wanted to produce enhanced debt forecasts, which is something we're often asked to do to produce um, forecasts of the debt balance in the future. But something that we really wanted to do was to be able to um, simulate uh, what-if scenarios of certain changes that were being asked. And the sort of changes that we were being asked for is what would happen if we could change, actually, the inflow rate of debts, if we could change the timing of when things came in. We've looked at outsourcing debts to debt collection agencies. What would be the impact of doing that? And what could we do with the freed up resource that would be working on the debts that otherwise we would still have on our books? And how best to deploy our staff and the processes and the priorities for working debts and really looking at optimising the deployment of our staff and the use of debt collection agencies. And we wanted to be able to give results from our model in terms of the debt balance, which is the key statistic, um, volumes and values of payments or other clearances of debts, and a new measure for HMRC, which is called roll rate, which is essentially what proportion of debts are cleared within 30 days of them coming on our books or within 90 days of coming on our books. That's a new measure that we're looking at now. And that's really looking at targeting debts quicker and dealing with them as soon as they come on. So what approach to modelling to take? We considered um, three types of modelling, spreadsheet modelling, discrete events in simulation and system dynamics. We quite quickly ruled out spreadsheet modelling. We already had a quick Excel model anyway that had gone as far as we could with it. Um, so really we were looking for a simulation technique. Um, discrete event simulation, it was quite viable for us to um, simulate individual items, but we're talking hundreds and thousands of debts. It would be quite a vast um, job to do. And in terms of stocks and flows and the way that system dynamics works, um, it, was a, it was a perfect match, really. Debts could be modelled as stocks that flow between different parts of the HMRC processes with the flow rates and routes decided by data inputs. So it was looking like system dynamics was the route that we should take. We also thought about feedback loops. Another key factor why spreadsheet modelling wouldn't have been viable. You can't feed things back onto itself. You'll get lots of error messages. Um, but feedback loops are quite crucial to this system because... Debt inflows next year are very much affected by what's happening now. If we can reduce our debt balance, if we can successfully pursue, pursue cases and discourage people from getting into debt in the future, that's very much a strong feedback loop in our model. And the other factor we looked at was um, delays, and very much the way that discrete event simulation and system dynamics 
model delays was a, a clear indication to us that system dynamics was the route to go. Because if you think of discrete event simulation as your you know, widgets on a factory production line, really, and they're sort of moving along and then getting um, stuck waiting to go to the next point. In, in terms of depths within HMRC, it's not quite as simple as a queue building up. We would perhaps send a letter to a, to a debtor saying that they owe us a debt, and we need to wait a sort of a minimum period of time before we can then do anything else, giving them the chance to respond to that letter. And that matched much better with the way that system dynamics model delays. So we chose to go down the system dynamics route. I'm now going to use our bathtub of debt analogy just to talk through the, the sheer complexity of the problem that we were facing. And fluids is quite a good way of describing system dynamics in any case. So we've gone down this water analogy. Um, so if we say that our debt management and banking systems are the bathtub, they're the scope of our model, and that our debt items are the water in our bathtub, essentially our inflow is coming in through the tap and our outflow through the, through the plug hole. So our, our inflow, turning the taps on, can be affected by a number of different factors. It can certainly be affected by the state of the economy. It can be affected by policy changes that we make within HMRC. Uh, for example, new penalties. But these could affect uh, the inflows both positively or negatively in terms of if a new penalty is a good deterrent from getting into debt in the first place we can slow our tap down. But unfortunately, if it's, if it's not a very effective policy change, we will get the original debt plus the penalty on top of that. If we can prevent spurious debts from creating on the systems in the first place, we can help to reduce the inflow rate. And as I've just talked about the feedback loop as well, the feedback loop from our plug hole, the deterrent effect of successfully pursuing debts in the past can have an impact on the inflow of debts in the future. If we now look at the outflow rate of our bath through the plug hole, that can also be affected by the, the state of the economy and also by the level and success of pursuit by our staff. But it gets a bit more complicated than that because we really need more than one plug hole in our bath because we have different flow rates depending on what type of clearances that we, that we clear the debt with. It differs if it's a payment, it differs if it's a, a write-off or remission, or also we've got the sending debts to debt collection agencies, which may or may not come back to us later, depending on their success. But then it gets more complicated still, because we actually need more than one bath, because we need a, a different bath for each kind of debt, we cover several heads of duty as self-assessment, VAT, corporation tax, and they all have their own systems. They all behave slightly differently. So within our several baths, we've now got about a dozen baths, um, within each of those, we have debts of different values. And those debts will behave and be pursued very differently if they're high-value debts or low-value debts. So essentially, within each of our baths, we need more than one kind of liquid. And then, the longer the debt stays on our books, the more difficult it will be to, to clear it as a payment and the more likely that it will end up being written off. So essentially, the liquid is changing over time and becoming more stagnant. And the longer it stays in the bath, the more likely it's going to go down the write-off plug hole rather than the payment plug hole. And obviously, it's the payment plug hole that we want. <laughs> and all the time that our debts remain in our system, there is that opportunity that they could clear on their own as well, with the self-clearance. And finally, in our bath, we've actually got some liquids that's not even real in the first place, because it's spurious debts. And do we get, send them down a plug hole, or do we let those evaporate? So that's essentially the, the issues we were facing. I was going to take us back now to sort of the beginning of the system dynamics model work, and just sort of say the framework that we... Um, operated on is we were essentially linking the behaviour of three basic stocks and flows. Our resources, debt items and debt values. As I've said, um, we had several different bars, so each type of debt needed to be to modelled separately. 
But the whole process worked in the same way that new debts would flow into the model for various reasons, incorrect payments, outstanding returns are a couple of examples. Then transferred within our system between different functions within our debt management and banking branch and then stay within that model until such time as they clear in terms of a payment or a write-off. And the way we uh, approached this project is we, um, first of all, needed to capture the factors that affected our system. And we had workshops with our colleagues from debt management and produced process maps for each type of debt. I'll show you an example of one of those on the next slide. But I'll just say that we went on from those and produced a simulation model. We used Fensim software. I'm not on commission here, but it's a really useful, <laughs> should be maybe. Found it a really useful, uh, user-friendly tool, and particularly um, made use of the interface that it's got with Excel for both inputs and outputs. So all our numbers are sitting in an Excel spreadsheet and feeding into the, to the Vensim software, so it's very easy for us to audit and maintain the numbers side of it. Did you look at any other software? Um, I've seen a Stellar and I, and I Think before. I Think was another possibility to us. We, we were really sort of restricted to, to Vensim or I Think purely because that's what we had available to us within HMRC. And I'd used Vensim months before and found it very user-friendly. So it wasn't, it wasn't a very um, detailed investigation <laughs> of available software. It was what we had available to us, really. I don't know if you can see that on there. Um, it doesn't matter if you can't read the words, it's more about the process and the opportunity to have a go on one of these. Yeah. This is a process map for, um, it's actually for corporation tax. And debts flow in on our top corner there and they go into um, a hopper, which is where debts are held until such time as they are pulled by the, relative, the relevant campaign for that tax, type of tax. And from that campaign OU, debts tend to follow certain uh, routes. And for corporation tax, if they're very high value, they end up at our telephone centre for an outbound telephone call. If they've got a, um, a signal on them to say that they've been uh, a poor debtor in the past, they get sent to our technical office to be worked by a member of staff. And everyone else gets sent an automated letter to start with. And we wait a period of time before we do anything else. Um, and from there, debts escalate. If they haven't reached a clearance, they move through to more severe distraint action, court action, possibly even bankrupt, bankruptcy, ugh, bankruptcy and insolvency. But the main sort of um, point I wanted to say with this process map was actually the process of doing the workshops. When we sat down with our colleagues and talked through the different processes for each type of debt, we actually found they weren't as dissimilar as we thought. And what we ended up with is essentially having this picture as a, a blueprint for every type of tax debt that we were going through. All the stocks were always there. And to a great extent, so were the flows. There were a few flows that changed. It was really the reasons that taxes, that tax debts were flowing from one escalation point to the other, which varied across the tax duties. But really, we found actually we had almost a, a, a core map for all of them. I wanted to show you now a very partial view of our simulation model. This actually is um, from the CT bathtub, or a very small part of the, D the CT bathtub. And it actually represents where corporation tax debts fly, uh, come into our debt technical office, which was the bit in the middle of the process map on the previous slide. Um, so the flow in on the left is really um, a transfer from other parts of the debt management and banking system. And they can flow out um, either in terms of clearances to the little cloud or moved on to another part of, uh, of the system. Um, but if you remember, I was saying, as well as having um, several baths, we had several different kinds of liquid within each because it matters to us the value of the debts and the age of the debts um, because they're going to be pursued and act very differently. And the way that we deal with that is to use subscripts within Vensim. And we've subdivided the stocks and flows for our CT debts by both value bands 
and by age bands. So behind each of those stocks and flows, there's multiple equations represented by subscripts. But how to determine the, the age of a debt? Because when a debt's first come into our system, they're all new debts. They've come in right at the hopper stage and been transferred along. So um, the way that we uh, age debts is, again, using subscripts. And you see the flow at the top of the diagram. I'm enjoying using this. This is a suppressed thing I've always wanted to do. Um, using the flow that flows from the DT set item stock back into itself, the DTO CT, DTO CT items aging flow. And uh, basically, um, for equation lovers, there's the equation. You take the, the, the stock items, subtract the things that are flowing out of the stock, and then divide it by your average time in your cohort to age, to age the debts. You do that all the way through the model. Things age over time. Oh, more equations for equation lovers. That's just showing how we then calculate the, the stock itself. So for new debts, you've got the summation of things coming in, going out, being cleared, or aging up from new. And for everything else, you've got the things that have aged from the previous cohort, plus the things coming in, minus things going out, minus things going, getting cleared, minus the thing aging to the group after that. And the final um, element I wanted to talk about from our, from our modelling was um, move, how to move debts on, and in terms of how we um, decide which debts are actually going to be pursued. Because in reality, for our staff working debts, they prioritise the debts they're going to work, and they prioritise them according to age and value. They prioritise working the newest debts first, because that's one of our key targets, and the highest value debts, quite obviously, really, <laughs> the two key things. So the way we work out for the model how to prioritise debts is we um, can determine how many items are available from our stock. And we really need to do a summation of how many... Uh, we need to, uh, need to work out how many debts to action. And the way we do that is to use an allocate by priority function, which is a built-in function in Vensim. And we essentially say, allocate what's available according to the priorities, which is age and value, um, constrained by our staff, how much staffing we've got available, which is our DTO contact availability in the top right. And that, in turn, is a function of the allocate by priority equation because we have a certain amount of debts within our debt technical office and we have a certain number of people and we need to, um, to balance the availability of our people and what we need to work on by what is our top priority debts at that time. Because we may want to be working on corporation tax debts ahead of self-assessment debts, ahead of something else at a certain period of time to deal with our stocks and flows. I also want to show you an example of some of the output that the model can produce. And this is a, a debt balance chart. The top line is our, our base model. And the pink line is showing um, one of our scenarios of outsourcing debts to debt collection agencies. So as you can see, the two lines sort of mirror each other in, in profile, but the, the gap between the two lines is increasing over time. And that's really showing not just the initial impact of taking some debts and giving them over to debt collection agencies and getting them off our books, but it's the accrued, accrued effects and the feedback loops that are saying, well, we've freed up some staff and we can work on these debts as well, and now we've worked on more debts and we've got an improvement in our feedback loop in later years. What happens in September? What happens in September with the, chain, the peak? It's, ju it's just reflecting um, um, an inf a large inflow of debts at that point. Yeah. I should probably say this isn't, this isn't final data either. It's, this is example data that's in here. Um, so there, there will be other peaks at certain other times as well, particularly around the uh, beginning of February. There will be a big SA peak around there. So where we are now, I've just said it really, the, the core structure of the model is there, although we are still doing some, some further work, particularly around our feedback loops, and making sure that they, they hold true. But we're now at the stage of, of getting the real data fed into the model and testing it, making revisions to the model on the back of that testing, and um, making revisions to our assumptions as well. And I thought I'd finish with uh, just 
showing up some of the sort of key questions that our customers are, are asking us and what we're um, intending to use this model to help to answer. Um, I've spoken about the first two already. What's the impact of outsourcing um, specific type of debts to debt collection agencies? Which are the best debts to send to debt collection agencies? Um, how we can optimise the use of our resources? What should they be working on? Where should they be located within the system? What would be the impact of um, either delaying or advancing activity on certain types of debts at certain times a year, particularly because it is a very peaky uh, profile of debts? Are our roll rate targets that have been set within HMRC, are they achievable? And how do we need to move our staff around in order that we can achieve them? <laughs> and uh, the final one is sort of on the back of a, an internal audit office recommendation to change our focus to see what each operation brings in per member of staff is what is the value, what is the contribution for a full-time equivalent member of staff? And that's all we were going to say. Thank you.